All right, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Matthew Eschelbach. If you have not done a roundtable with Dr. Eschelbach before, uh, he is actually started uh, doing a lecture the last time on childbirth and obstetrical emergencies, and he's going to be finishing that tonight. Uh, Dr. Eschelbach is an emergency physician, and, and as you can see, the medical director of EMS and trauma systems for St. Charles Health System in Redmond, Oregon. He has been teaching with us once or twice a month for quite some time now, and he teaches on the EMS circuit and, and really is a, a respected member of the EMS medical director's community. So that having been said, make sure that you participate, that you're still here until the end of this. If Dr. Eschelbach uh, talks to you, you should answer your questions. And, um, uh, basically, you'll I'll be checking on you. Or we'll be checking on you at the end as well, and possibly intermittently to make sure you're still here. So please feel free to participate. I hear noise in the background. Is yeah, that I think it's Dr. David? David, is that David Nibs? David. David. Uh, David. Ah, I'll mute you, David. There we go. Right. There you go. Thank you. Got it. All right. We ready to begin? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay, very good. Welcome. Uh, good evening, everybody. Happy summer. I know this is just where everybody wants to be during the summer, sitting down at a six o'clock lecture uh, on my time. Who knows, eight o'clock, nine o'clock on your time. So I'll try and be uh, succinct as much as I can. Um, last month, we covered pretty much normal deliveries with a few complications. And you can review that on your own. And I believe the last thing we talked about was cephalopelvic disproportion. And uh, that means a, a head that's too big for the birth canal. And we're gonna start with our first major complication. Um, not that you can do anything about it, but you just need to know that it exists. So. Uh, like any time, if you have a question, uh, type it in or unmute and you can ask the question. I don't mind being interrupted. And uh, if you want to save it to the end, write it down. It's hard for me to do both at one time. So we'll go from here. So the major uh, complication that you're going to deal with or that you have to look out for is something that uh, is called meconium. Uh, meconium is usually the first uh, stool that a child has about 24 hours after they are born. Um, it can be light or heavy and it's uh, actually it's the combination of this dark material that's made up of GI secretions and it's usually um, secreted into the child and there's something that's called a, uh, a meconium plug and that child, it's kind of like a plug in the rectum and a child doesn't normally pass that stool until about 24 hours after birth. But it's green, it can be yellow, it's kind of tarry-like, and it's very, very uh, thick. That usually happens after the baby's out of the birth canal. But if you see this green color early on, there's not much that you can do with it, except know that you have to do some basic things that we'll talk about in just a minute. All right, somebody else has a baby? There we go. Okay, good. Um, Jane, maybe you can um, mute somebody? Okay. There we go. So meconium, it is possible to be in an up to about 12% of births. If you see meconium, that green color, you know green is not normal. It's relatively common. And it's more common in people who go past their dates. In nowadays, people don't go past dates very, uh, very much, and it's rarely seen before 34 weeks. It is very, very toxic to the lungs and it activates something that's called surfactant. If you remember last time I talked about neonatal medicine starting way back when in 1963, well, one of the biggest problems about babies being born is meconium can burn their lungs and surfactant is the major uh, material made by the body to expand the lungs. 
because remember the baby is kind of scuba diving for nine months while they uh, gestate or grow larger. So if meconium gets into the lungs and they breathe it into the lungs, that's a bad thing. 35% of the kids who aspirate, that means get it below their vocal cords, develop complications. It could be a pneumothorax, up to 4% can actually die, and uh, two-thirds of these uh, can have some type of pulmonary hypertension, and it's a bad thing. But meconium aspiration syndrome, which is the major complication, uh, is the presence of meconium below the vocal cords. Very often, kids just breathe in, get a little in their mouth, but if they aspirate it below the vocal cords, that's a dangerous thing. Uh, you need to report it uh, because when this happens, uh, when you see green in the amniotic fluid, you have to take a deep breath and make sure that you start to suction the mouth, then the nose with a bulb and suction catheter. You want to get that out of the mouth because you don't want that baby to suck that down and take a cry. So remember, while that baby is still in the canal, it's breathing fluid and it's going in and out and the circulation comes from the cord. Once that baby comes out of the canal, before the shoulders are delivered, you want to make sure that that kiddo is taken care of and you suction that. Uh, assess the baby immediately, and if the child is vigorous, good tone, strong respiratory effort, you don't need the suction, the trachea. Uh, it's very, very difficult uh, in neonatology when neonatal nurses and neonatal ICU doctors practice their intubation skills for neonates, young ones. They practice on kittens, if you can believe that or not. So I think it's hard enough to do an adult these guys are one level above us. Um, if the child is depressed, meaning their, their APGAR scores, which we covered last time, are low, uh, don't stimulate them. Uh, try and get tracheal suction under direct visualization if possible and withdraw the meconium out of the vocal cords. What do you do if you can't do that? You've got to let the hospital know. You've got to let the treating physician know uh, the ER physician or an obstetrician who's going to meet you, and you want them to know that there was meconium, and I had to try it and do my best to suction it out. Um, ideally, if you have a depressed infant, you don't want to give positive pressure ventilation until more meconium is suctioned out. When we talk about neonatal resuscitation, one of the first things we do is give the kid oxygen and and, and try and stimulate the lungs. Meconium, you got a big red flag. Well, what do I do? What if the kid's not breathing? Well, you gotta make a choice, do the best you can to get all the meconium out of there and then start your resuscitation because you'd rather have a child who has potential complications than not have a child at all. Most often the child will brady down and you'll need to give positive pressure ventilation before all of the meconium is suctioned. Uh, you guys carry these little things that are called meconium aspirators. They usually take up space. Again, just as a reminder, it's a very rare occasion when you have to deliver a baby. But when you do, you need to be prepared. Uh, meconium aspirator simply goes up into your suction and you try on the right hand side here. This, you're gonna, that's what you're going to pass below the trachea if you can to suction out the meconium. All right, now we're going to talk about newborn resuscitation. This is where you're going to think I'm bipolar because I just told you things not to do, but we'll tell you about things to do with a newborn. Um, you want to make sure some history. Is this baby early? In today's environment, most women have good neonatal care. Most women have uh, regular checkups, but you never know where you're going to go, whether or not this mom has gotten prenatal care. You want to know how far along this woman is. They can usually tell you. Um, if the water is broken and the uh, fluid is brown or greenish uh, in color, 
suspect meconium aspiration. Is there more than one child in there? Most women know, but there are some places where they may not know. They may come from another country, they may be visiting from another country, they may be uh, uncared for in the country they came from, so we have to be careful. And you wanna know if mom did any drugs. Uh, which goes to our very, very first question four weeks early. If mom does cocaine, she can deliver early. There was an epidemic in the early, uh, late 80s, early 90s of women who were smoking crack cocaine, and it was probably the number one cause of early delivery. You want to uh, position the child, position the head, slightly lower than the body and elevate the shoulders with a one inch pad if possible. You wanna turn the uh, infant's head to the side, suction the mouth first with a bulb syringe as we talked about, and you wanna do this two to three times, followed by the nose. Uh, if the nose is suctioned before the mouth, the newborn may be stimulated to breathe in and they can inhale the fluid. We talked about that time, that last time as well. So here's a proper way to do it. You take these bulb syringe, you should have them in your kits in the ambulance. I'm sure anyone who's had a child has about three or four of these things at home, or one or two maybe, and you figure out what to do with them. They're always good for cleaning out ears or something, but you wanna remove the secretions from the mouth and then the nose. Uh, you want to gently stimulate the baby, uh, one flick against the newborn's heel, uh, lightly slap the sole of the newborn. You don't have, you can rub the lower back. You don't have to turn the baby upside down and slap the buttocks. That's Hollywood. Um, and that's really not what we do anymore. So here is our protocol, our central organ protocol for neonatal resuscitation. And this comes right out of uh, NALS or neonatal uh, pre-hospital uh, ATLS or advanced cardiac life support. So it comes out of NALS or PALS. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time because this is not a NALS or a PALS, but you want to know just like this. Is this a term? Is the amniotic fluid clear? Is the infant breathing? Does the infant have a good muscle tone? If it's yes, routine care. No, you work through this just as we talked about. Evaluate the heart rate. If they're breathing with a heart rate greater than 100 and they're pink, great. Do your APCARs and move forward. If their heart rate is less than 100 and they're a little blue, remember every child is born a little blue, give them a minute or so and they'll pink up. You want to give them oxygen as much as possible. All right. If they're asked, uh, apneic or gasping and they have a heart rate less than 100, positive pressure ventilation. Remember the caveat or warning here is with meconium, be careful. If the heart rate is less than 60, you begin chest compressions. If it's greater than 60, you follow your tree for ABCs. And then if you need to establish IO, these are tiny, tiny babies. And remember, IO access, even those, these are my protocols. I told you this baby is born with an IV within your eye's reach. And you look at the baby, you aim for the mouth, meaning if it's an upside down smile, two eyes and a mouth, you aim for the mouth and you start the IV there. We talked about that last time. And then you can give Epi fluid challenge and you wanna check a blood sugar. This is really important. If this kid has a blood sugar that's like 25 or 50, he might just need a little bit of glucose and you just follow your protocol for glucose replacement. So you can see, if you look at this, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, things are moving fast, uh, probably faster than you think. You want to give them oxygen as much as possible. You can uh, show you a picture. You keep the tubing uh, as high as possible and about a half inch from their nose and you want to check their breathing and monitor their pulse.
just like that. So you can see there's not, you don't have to put a nasal cannula on, you just make a little cup with your hands and bring it close to the child and that child will get plenty of oxygen. Uh, now, if the newborn uh, is receiving oxygen and they remain blue after 30 uh, to 60 seconds and has a pulse less than 100, you're gonna assist ventilations and get them moving as quickly as possible. Um, if they're gasping or if their heart rate uh, goes down, you're gonna assist ventilations. Uh, use a bag valve mask with a snug fit. You should have a tiny little one in there. Attach the oxygen and make sure you watch for chest rise. Be very, very careful. Next time you're at a conference or a learning conference, see if you can't find a representative who has a machine that teaches you how to determine how much oxygen you're giving and how much you're squeezing a baby in a neonatal resuscitation scenario. You'll be surprised how much oxygen you wind up giving and you don't want to blow a kid's lung out and how fast you wind up going. So as your adrenaline rushes, so will that. So you want to have somebody count out loud and make sure you don't give too much. You don't use a normal bag valve, tiny little bag valve mask, and you'll get this done. Uh, you continue their assisted breathing and you try and get that up with their heart rate less than until it's above 100 just like that. This is probably actually too big of a picture because the one that you, this is probably the size of what I'd say is a small Nerf football and this child is really way too big, but this is the only picture I could find. What you want to do is the bag valve mass you're gonna have for a neonate is gonna be very small. It's gonna be about the size of an orange or an apple and this bag valve mask will even be smaller. And you can see though, the technique is correct, one-handed. He's got one finger under the chin, one wrapped on either side, and he's squeezing it in a controlled fashion. You should have your partner count out loud. Uh, pulse is the most important, reliable indicator of oxygenation in these kids. A normal pulse rate in kids, remember, is 120 to 180. These kids are little rabbits and they go fast. So less than 100 indicates low blood flow. Keep in mind with your APGAR, you're gonna do your APGAR at one minute and five minutes. So you get a point off if their heart rate is less than 100 and uh, you get an extra point if their heart rate goes up. Assessing the pulse, a brachial pulse if you can, you can feel the cord. The umbilical cord in the baby's abdomen is a perfect place to put your hand right on an artery and a vein. Keep in mind that they're backwards in the umbilical cord because as we discussed about last time, the vein is the big one and the artery is a small one in the cord. So if the pulse is between 80 and 100, you're gonna continue uh, ventilations less than 60, you're gonna begin CPR. Uh, this is part of our, our guidelines as well. Just what I said, just now, 40 to 60. Uh, compressions should be three to one with 90 compressions and 30 breaths to achieve approximately 120 events per minute. That's why you, if you're doing this alone, Great, if you've got somebody there with you, it's not gonna take two people to work on this child. Somebody's gotta count out loud. Uh, continue the pression, uh, compressions until they get up to 80, and you wanna continue the assisted ventilations until the heart rate's above 100. Just like this, okay? So this is two people, thumbs on the chest, overlapping. Um, and you only have to press a little tiny bit. You know, I think it's kind of comical when, in all honesty, they tell us to do something a half inch or an inch. 
you don't know. It's like squeezing a lemon and how much did you actually depress? It's difficult. So do it fast, do it hard, but you don't want to harm the child. Possibly using intubation is there. That's a skill that's really, really difficult. And to be totally honest, I'm not sure I could do it in a pinch. So you guys um, do the best you can. During the transport, keep the child warm. Make sure you monitor the baby's pulse and look for breathing and skin tones. That's all part of your APGAR. And make sure you notify the hospital you're on your way. You don't want to show up with a mom and a baby and they don't know you're there. All right. Now we're going to go on to a few pregnancy complications, things that can happen during the uh, pregnancy of a mom. And these things are specific to different aspects of pregnancy. So we've talked about normal delivery. We've talked about the first complication of normal delivery that could be meconium. And, that, and we talked about uh, assessing the baby and making the baby better. Now let's talk about things that could be going wrong in the pregnancy. So DIC, rare. It's going to happen, but it'll happen with some of the things that we talk about. DIC is called disseminated intervascular coagulation. That's not really something that you guys are going to diagnose but you're going to want to pass that information on. What happens in DIC is all the platelets that are in the mom are consumed to try and stop bleeding or by some other process that the platelets clump together and once they clump together, mom can bleed to death or the baby can bleed to death. So you have to keep that in mind. Preeclampsia is high blood pressure. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Abruptio, we'll talk about that. That's what happens when the uterus ruptures. If a baby dies before, uh, sometimes babies die for some reason inside the mom, that can cause it. And sepsis, when mom gets sick and baby gets sick. All right, questions out there? No, okay, good. All right, obstetrical complications. These are things that can happen along the way. Some of them are pregnancy related. I mean, they're all pregnancy related and some of them um, you're, you may not even see. So early pregnancy bleeding. A lot of women panic, especially if it's their first or second child. If they see a little blood, if they have a history of anxiety, or let's face it, sometimes people see blood and they think, I'm going to lose this baby. But sometimes bleeding in early pregnancy can be normal. A little bit of spotting can be normal. But when they call you guys, you're gonna to have to go through this systematically and figure out what's going on. Early pregnancy bleeding can be a miscarriage. And remember, miscarriage is also called a spontaneous abortion. Spon abortion is not the verb that we talk about on TV and the news all the time. It just means that you had a miscarriage. The cervix from the mom can become incompetent, meaning it doesn't hold the baby well. And if that happens in one pregnancy, usually the doctor will take some, the obstetrician will take some form of action to prevent it from happening again. Uh, so the baby can't be held. That's a premature dilation of the cervix. Ectopic pregnancy, we'll talk about in a minute. And hydatiform mole, you'll never see this, but it's kind of an odd thing. This is a pregnancy that instead of having a child, a woman gets a positive pregnancy test, and inside that pregnancy is hair and teeth and all kinds of things that Somehow the body got fooled that there's a pregnancy going on. You're not ever going to see that, but a woman might pass a piece of bleeding and a piece of tissue, and you're like, 
what is that, a bone in there? And it's actually a piece of teeth or a piece of hair. And remember from last time, anything that a woman passes that you don't know what it is, save it, put it in a bag, and give it to the nurse in the ER or the doctor in the ER. Miscarriage um, is any pregnancy that ends before 20 weeks, and that's called a spontaneous abortion. Uh, 20 weeks is considered to be the point of viability. Um, remember that from our last lecture, we said that the needle moves 20 weeks, 22 weeks, 25 weeks. It's all kind of in there. There have been reports where children, uh, I think 22 weeks is really the lowest that we have recorded where a child lived. But remember, built into that 20 weeks is four weeks of I'm not sure. So a woman could be pregnant for four weeks and not know it and even have a light period for her first period after she conceives a child. So they might be fooled and their dates might be off. That period is usually very short, a little bit of spotting and all rules are off essentially. So that child might be 24 weeks and uh, you don't know. Uh, symptoms of a miscarriage, uh, presence of bleeding. They might feel contractions, they might not. They might have abdominal pain, they might not. And if it occurs before six weeks, um, the woman may not even know and just think it's her normal period that came late. Um, it may be thought to be a normal period. Types of miscarriage. You don't really have to know this, but you should know that the terms are there. A threatened miscarriage means there's bleeding, but the baby's still alive. So we see a lot of these. You're gonna get a call that a woman's bleeding, you transport her to the hospital. We do an ultrasound, we check the baby, the baby's okay. And um, it's called a threatened miscarriage. Inevitable means it's coming no matter what, there's nothing we can do. Complete miscarriage, the, ba the mother has passed tissue, the cervical os is closed, and all the products of conception have been passed through. And a missed miscarriage, the fetus is dead but hasn't been expelled. Again, you don't know, have to know these, just know that they exist. So here's normal fertilization, going back to, as we said, high school biology and high school health. Uh, a normal ovulation occurs uh, from the, uh, an egg is expelled from the ovary. It goes into the fimbrinae and it usually is fertilized right up here in the first third of the fallopian tube. It then becomes what's called a morula, a morula is like a baby that's now dividing, you know, uh, 23 um, chromosomes met with the father's 23, and now it's a fertilized egg. That fertilized egg goes down here, and usually this is where uh, a normal pregnancy implants, anywhere along this ridge. An ectopic pregnancy is when the egg implants outside of the uterus. So here's our normal area here or here. And generally, by the way, a woman ovulates one month on the left and the next month on the right. Can she ovulate from both at the same time? Yes. Can she ovulate more than one egg? Yes. Does she have a problem? Did she go to fertility specialist and the fertility specialist put her on a medicine so that she released a lot of eggs? That's possible too. So there might not be one, there might be two, there might be three, there may be many. So ectopic pregnancy happens when the ovum or the egg goes anywhere other than where it's supposed to go. And the answer is, almost anywhere. It can be actually happened in the ovary itself, in the tube, 
way up here in what's called the isthmus, or it can go inside the uterus, find a little place, and it can also go in the cervical region. It can actually fall into the abdomen and still be fertilized. Remember, the swimmers, the sperm just come up and they just keep going until they fall out here. It can actually fall into the abdomen and implant in the abdomen itself. These are can be deadly. We don't miss them very often anymore, but they can be deadly if we don't have a high index of suspicion and keep them in mind. So what are the signs and symptoms? They're pretty simple. You miss a period and they think they're pregnant. Uh, you get some tenderness in the adnexa, that's the area kind of below the belly button and above the pubic bone, that's the adnexal area. There could be tenderness there. Uh, they might have dark blood vaginally. Uh, the pain could be on one side or both sides, and you, they may have rep uh, referred pain to the shoulder. I have seen cases where people miss ectopic pregnancies and people go home because they've got shoulder pain, and it's really a pregnancy that's high and to the right. We have to be careful. Treatment, uh, if the tube is unruptured, uh, the doctor can give a shot of something called methotrexate. Methotrexate is used for people who have rheumatoid arthritis and it actually dissolves the fetal tissue. Sometimes they have to go to surgery to remove the fetal tissue from the tube and rupture of the tube usually means surgical removal of the tube and that is considered an emergency. All right, we're gonna go on to that's ectopic pregnancy that usually happens early. A woman will almost always get an ultrasound by 18 weeks if she's being followed. And by 18 weeks, we can see that the baby goes into the uterus and we don't miss ectopic pregnancies much anymore. They still can be missed. Later in pregnancy, these are the big ones, placenta previa, abruptio placenta, cord insertion and placental variations. I'll talk about those in a few minutes. So, abruptio placenta, very bad. Uh, that's premature separation of the placenta before the third stage of labor. So if you remember back when we talked about uh, the stages of labor, there's stage one, two, three, and then they deliver uh, deliver the placenta, and this is during uh, premature separation. So here's a normal healthy baby. He's upside down, like we talked about last time. And here is the placenta, and it begins to separate, and now the woman begins to bleed. It's more common uh, in mothers who have a history of high blood pressure, or they've had more than five births. Some will, how, some way, there's more of associate, association with lower socioeconomic status. That's probably because these women uh, don't have a lot of money. They may not have access to healthcare, although in almost every, well, in every hospital in the nation that has um, a emergency department, you have to have somebody who can handle what's going on with the baby. That's part of the EMTALA law. The last part of EMTALA is Labor Act. And you have these folks who, some people don't get into that uh, system and they don't get an ultrasound and they don't know that there might be a problem. So that's that. So with abruptio placenta, you get premature separation uh, part or all of the placenta may separate. Uh, causes also include high blood pressure, cocaine, which I talked to you about before, or this woman is in uh, a fender bender or a high speed accident. Not usually a fender bender, but something a little bit more. So what happens is, let's say she's wearing her three point restraint across her shoulder 
on her hip and across her lap. She's supposed to put that belt below her pregnancy and she's involved in a high speed deceleration injury. Her body goes forward. Maybe the seatbelt slips up and maybe the seatbelt pulls a little bit of that going on. So that's also a risk factor. Grades of separation, you don't really have to know these, just know that they exist. This is up to the OB doctor. Um, one, vaginal bleeding with tenderness. Grade two is uterine tenderness and tetany. That's a nice word of saying uh, the uterus is tight. Um, mom is okay, but the baby is stressed and 50% um, of the placenta is probably involved by that time. Grade three is severe separation where there is severe tetany going on. That's tetany is just like the word tetanus. It's spasms of the uterus. Um, mom can be in shock. The fetus is usually dead by this time. And then greater than 50% of this surface here is detached. So if you look at this very closely, if 100% is from here to here, if greater than 50, that's considered uh, phase three. And this you would suspect cocaine use if the patient has abruptio placenta. Symptoms of abruptio placenta, and this is really key, severe pain. When we talked about, when we talk about placenta previa, we'll see it's painless bleeding. So that's the difference. If you've got a woman who is pregnant and now bleeding and that bleeding is and that pain is not from contractions that's a bad thing severe pain fetal distress it's usually darker bleeding the abdomen is hard and she has symptoms of shock you don't want to miss that a woman who has a little bit of bleeding we call it the bloody show we talked about normal deliveries last time maybe up to a uh, you know, a half cup of blood or so, but this is more severe and it's constant pain as opposed to pain that goes away with a contraction. The fetus, if you can hear it, is in distress and the bleeding is dark. What do you do? Left lateral recumbent position. I showed you slides, we'll go over that one more time. 100% oxygen, treat her like a trauma victim two large bore IVs, normal saline, lactated ringers, and you wanna do the best you can to alert the hospital and monitor mom and child. You're not going to deliver this child in the ambulance. You're gonna do the best you can to rush this kid as fast as possible, mom and kid, to a place where they can handle the delivery. All right, now placenta previa, Sounds a little bit the same, but it is different. Remember in abruptio placenta, we talked about the placenta actually separating prematurely from the uterus. Here's the uterus, and here's where the placenta is placed. This is almost always caught on an ultrasound. The placenta, usually it's a little bit higher up, but as it creeps down, we worry about what's called previa. The placenta precedes the fetus. Remember, in a normal delivery, the baby comes out and then the placenta. And in this one, instead of being up here where it belongs, it's down low. It's more common in women who've had more than a couple of children, um, and it's usually the placenta is larger. Now, where does it go? Sometimes it, it is implanted right here at the cervical opening, and sometimes it's covering the cervical opening. Um, the placenta previa is where the placenta goes low. Visa previa is something you're never gonna worry about, just know that it exists, and that's an insertion um, where this cord that's covering the child 
uh, can easily be lacerated. So that's something for an OB board question, not for you guys. All right, what are the risk factors for placenta previa? Uh, a previous C-section, there are lots of women who have what's called a VBAC. That's a virginal, um, virginal, <laughs> sorry. That's a misstep, sorry. A vaginal birth, vaginal birth after C-section. So some of these women will go on, and I told you last time that's a specialty place. You have to go to a higher level facility if you're gonna have a VBAC. But if you have a previous C-section, you're at risk. If you've had multiple children, if they smoke, if your pregnancies are closely spaced together, uh, that's usually two children inside of a year. And if the woman is over 35 years of age. Now, a lot of women now are over 35 years of age at, when they have their first child. So figure that out. This number might be changing, so I'd like to know what the current research is, but I have no new number for you. When I looked for it, it was still there. Here's the big thing, painless vaginal bleeding. Remember, placentia, uh, abruptio placenta, painful, painless vaginal bleeding. It's usually bright red instead of dark, and it may not begin until labor begins. So. Here's a, a normal placenta way up here above the baby's head in placenta previa. Down here is the placenta and mom begins to bleed early. Uh, this management, you don't do a vaginal exam. You guys aren't gonna do them anyway, um, except when that baby's head is coming out. You try and lift the head of the bed as much as you can, 100% oxygen and you wanna get two large bore IVs just like any trauma victim and monitor mom and baby. All right, here's a good thing to look at normal on the left. This is normal, placental abruption, bad, 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 blood and placenta are separating and placenta previa, not as bad, but you have to be prepared. All right, and these are our protocols, the East Cascade EMS protocols, and it tells you two simple things. It occurs in the third trimester. Lower abdominal pain in the uterus becomes rigid. Shock may develop. That's probably something that you need to, those two things are things you need to know. Previa, cervical opening can result in vaginal bleeding through the vagina and the infant needs to be delivered, usually via C-section. You guys aren't going to do that unless I said, well, you guys shouldn't have to do it. <laughs> Preeclampsia. This is a deadly disease if it's not taken care of. Uh, compromised metabolic activity in the mom. She gets sodium retention. She gets decreased renal function and she gets a decrease in her urination alterations in the vascular activity become the vessels become a problem and you get an increased cns activity classic triad is high blood pressure keep in mind 120 over 80 normal blood pressure right in a pregnant woman it might be hypertension so you want to know what was her blood pressure before she got pregnant. So if somebody's 90 over 60 and then she goes up to 125 over 80, that's greater than 30 millimeters of mercury, that could be a problem. So don't be fooled. They get sudden weight gain and they get edema to the hands, the face especially, and they can get the lower extremities. This is pathogenesis. You don't want to know what this means. Just know that there are bad things going on. Things like diabetes are risk factors and the child is not getting enough oxygen. The child slows down in its growth. Preeclampsia leads to eclampsia and I'll talk to about that in just a minute. It usually develops after the 20th week. So 
Remember we said about 20 to 22 is when that baby, you can feel it at the belly button. Um, it can be mild or severe. They can get increased hyperreflexia. They can get headache. They can get visual disturbances. They can get nausea and vomiting. And the worst case of OB that I ever took care of was a woman who came in in preeclampsia and I did everything I could to save her and save the baby, which I did. But um, it's one of those times in your career that you say, I hope that never happens again. And thankfully, knocking on wood, it hasn't happened to me yet. Or since, but it did happen to me. All right, the definition of high blood pressure in pregnancy, uh, can, like 140 over 90 previous, consider 125 over 75 prior to 32 weeks. So if you get an increase in just 15 millimeters of mercury, that could be considered hypertension in pregnancy. So let's say you've got 125 over 75, right? And now it's up, that could be high blood pressure. Eclampsia, the symptoms of severe preeclampsia are seizures, very, very bad, coma and hypertensive crisis. We'll talk about how to treat those in just a minute. Management, try and get them in a quiet room. That's not gonna happen in all honesty. Uh, you wanna get them in the left lateral recumbent position. Remember that's the position where the mom is laying on her side to get that baby off the aorta. So you wanna lay them on their left side. Oxygen, two liters of uh, fluid, two IVs started as quick as possible. And magnesium. This is a lifesaver. You don't, a woman's having a seizure or she's getting to the point where she might have a seizure. Ativan is not the answer. Valium is not the answer. Versed is not the answer. Pregnant woman, seizure, magnesium. All right. I'll talk about antidotes in just a minute. Consider sedatives. You can consider sedatives like Ativan, but that's not the treatment for a seizure. Diuretics, antihypertensives, and anticonvulsants are all possible. These are things that the ER doctor is going to do as soon as that baby gets there. He might be, if you're still carrying Lasix, he might tell you to do this, but you guys should all be carrying magnesium, and that's important. What does magnesium do? It blocks the uptake of acetylcholine, relaxing the smooth muscle. Uh, it depresses the central nervous system. Two to four grams is given, and then you put an infusion, um, one to three grams per hour. In a seizure, you're gonna kind of push this a whole lot quicker. I'll go, hopefully, I have that uh, picture for you. What are the side effects of magnesium? Drowsiness, flushing, they can break out in a sweat, hyporeflexia, and hypocalcemia. When we used to place, and they still do this, if a woman goes into preterm labor, one of the treatments might be she's placed on a magnesium drip by the obstetrician. And the poor medical student has to go in and check, or the nurse, check reflexes every hour to make sure we're not turning off all of the reflexes. Because one of the reflexes we don't want to turn off is breathing. That can happen. And then low blood calcium. So when is um, toxic from magnesium? When there's no deep tendon reflexes or you get respiratory paralysis. This is the same as giving somebody succinylcholine, although it works in a slightly different fashion. Too much magnesium is bad. You guys aren't going to do drips anyway, but you're going to give magnesium if they have a seizure. The antidote, calcium gluconate. Pretty easy. 
Calcium, magnesium are constantly fighting each other. If you give too much calcium, magnesium can glow, give, go low. If you give too much magnesium, the calcium will go low and they serve as um, antidotes for each other. For the high blood pressure, you guys aren't going to carry this, but the doctor is going to have, uh, put some hydralazine in there. He might use labetalol. Some of you might carry labetalol for your cardiac medication. Um, nitroprusside and nifedipine would also be choices. And you might talk to medical control and say, I don't have this. I don't have ipresoline. I don't have this. I don't have this. I don't have this. What do I do? He might say, give some nitroglycerin. It's close. It's in the same family. So he might do that if you've got no other route. And what do our protocols say? If in a seizure, follow seizure protocol, contact for consideration of magnesium sulfate. So I'm giving you a deep dive and your, your protocols probably say something like this. Follow seizure protocol, right? But if you've got a pregnant person, you're gonna get magnesium first and then start thinking about the anti-seizure medicines. If you're lucky enough, you might have a pregnant patient who's having a seizure just because she has a seizure and she's got a seizure disorder. So just like anything else, your history is important. Your history has to match your physical. You might not have anything, then you're on your own. So this is a real case presentation. 28 year old girl, para two means she's been pregnant two times. I mean, gravid two, para one. So remember, she's pregnant for the second time. She's got one healthy child. She's 32 weeks pregnant, and she complains of a headache. She goes to her obstetrician, who looks at her blood pressure, checks her urine, and says, I think you're going to be okay. That was a big mistake. So she, he gives her a prescription for Vicodin. So rather than stay at her home in California, she decides to travel to Oregon for a vacation. So she takes a Vicodin because she has a headache and she lies down to take a nap. She wakes up several hours later from her nap screaming because she calls 911 because she can't see. She's having no abdominal pain no vaginal bleeding, no discharge, and no difficulty bleeding. So paramedics call me. I'm in the ER and they say, we're coming in with a 32 week old pregnant female who can't see and has a headache. Her vital signs are a heart rate of 90, respiratory rate of 18. Look at this blood pressure, 205 over 110. She's got pitting edema, up to the knees and her face looks bloated. What do you think I did? I paged for OB right away. Turns out we didn't have OB that weekend and we had a brand new obstetrician and he was out on a run. Oh well, get ready Dr. Eschelbach, here we go. So what did I do? The woman came in I gave magnesium, she immediately had a seizure. I gave her apresoline. I called my family physician who was on call for obstetrics and we had a heart rate monitor on the mom. We sedated the mom and gave her magnesium. We gave her apresoline and then she laid back and she kind of fell asleep and we lost fetal heart tones on the baby. Now what do I do? I called for a crash C-section and just as I was about ready to cut the skin, in comes the optician from a run who saved the day and did some delivery with forceps, brought that baby out. Once we brought the baby out, the blood sugar was about 36. We gave sugar or dextrose, the obstetrician, sewed up the um, laceration he had made to deliver the child 
and mom did okay, her seizures stopped, her blood pressure came down. The cure for eclampsia is delivery of the baby. That child used to come back every summer. It had a little bit of cerebral palsy, and that was not my fault, that was nobody's fault, and that they, every summer they'd come back in and they'd thank us for saving the child. So that's OB in a nutshell. We've got five minutes for questions. I have a question. question. There you go. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, on the babies born that survived at 22 or 23 weeks, those were babies that were born in the hospital, though, weren't they? Uh, yeah. Well, yes and no. Born in the hospital, yes. If they are quickly, quickly taken to the right facility, those children could survive, but you're talking about minutes, not yeah. um, Mine's like 45 minutes down the road, lights and sirens. Yeah, yeah. I mean, man, I've had that too. I've had that, I think last year we talked about post-traumatic stress. And one time I had a woman, I looked in or she came complained of bleeding. She was 25 weeks pregnant. I looked in her cervix and there was a foot sticking out. I delivered that child in the hospital, but that child died because I had no neonatal resuscitation. I had no um, obstetrician, and I did everything I could to keep that child alive. But when the neonatal resuscitation unit came, um, and again, that's a long time ago, um, we're, we're under the gun. So yes, that can happen. Chances of you having that 22-week-old survive outside the hospital, 25-minute ride, boy, lights and sirens, get moving. Any other questions? All right, so what I expect then, if you have no questions, is tomorrow when you're on shift, we're volunteering and a woman comes in bleeding and abdominal pain. What do I do? You're going to have to go back and watch this lecture over again. Other than that, you guys have a great summer. Any other questions? Jane, anyone? Thank you, sir. I appreciate your time tonight. Great yeah. lecture. Thank you. All right, everybody. I've got your credit posted. Uh, and for you, Jesse, I went ahead and gave you credit for a chat room since you're not in uh, B2 yet. So thank you all and have a great night. Uh, Jane, I will um, figure out next month as soon as I get my schedule. Absolutely, thank you very much.